Hi, everyone. My name is Easy Lanza, most called that Easy. I am an AI open source evangelist working at Intel. And mainly this talk, what I wanted to talk today is like a non-stress talk about AI, about we heard a lot of things about AI, how is AI going on and, and everything. And my idea is to talk a bit about the myths, not like a myth buster, but something like that, uh, more like a brainstorming session about the importance of AI and why AI is, being, is becoming important. So we all heard something about AI and we can imagine like, depending on the kind of person or your experience or your previous experience, you may think that AI can be three different things mainly. You can think that AI more in the helpless part, like they can help you on, the, on your city, they can see your treats, they can see your streets, they can fix your, your things for your city, more like in the sustainable part, right? The other part is more like the futuristic part or the more things that we think that will be crazy, that will be a big robot, that will be killing people, that will be doing something really strange and really extreme. Um, but it's more in the part of that we can think that AI can be very crazy. And the other thing is that we thought in the 10 years ago, uh, so this is from a movie that I didn't see it on the theaters because um, I'm supposed to be young, but I mean, but I've seen it. Uh, so this is why we thought that AI was, be, was going to, to be right. So something really fun, crazy. So it's something really strange now. So mainly the, the, the agenda will be to focus on five myths, what I used to call five myths, that it's something that we used to think about it. Right, so we think that AI is the answer to anything. We would like to use AI, even if you see the conference or if you see the talks or if you go out there, you will see that everything has to be the word AI everywhere, right? So we may think that AI is to help us everywhere. And the other myth is about the LLMs. We think that AI is just LLMs. So it's just one part and we think that now it's all about LLMs. Now we all need to force to use LLMs everywhere or RAG now or any other thing in the future. The other thing is we, we can believe that these LLMs, they are smart enough that they can reason, that they can behave as a humans. And we, we can think like, we can be surprised, even if we, are if we are technical enough or not, we can be surprised of the results. We can think that they reason, that they can make some human behavior or something like that. The myth four is about open source, and we think that open source is risky. I mean, what, what about the security, the models, the governance of those models, if they have to be public or not public? We'll go deeper more. The initiatives that are the reality in terms of that, but it's mainly why open source matters for AI. And the last one is the more, I mean, the exager exaggerated, which is that all the jobs will be eliminated. So we think that they will be replacing us, and we don't care about working anymore, which will be great, but we'll, we will need to work, right? So it's something that we need to think about it. So to start talking about that, let's talk about what it's AI, mainly. Seems to be very simple, a very simple definition, but if we think about it, AI is mainly the capability of a system to mimic the human behavior, mainly. So that's the first point, and we need to start from there. So how we can mimic the human behavior, there's a lot of granularity there, and this is where the things start to be more complicated or more weird, right? So the first myth is AI is the answer to everything. So why we think that this is the answer to everything? Because we used to see it everywhere. We used to see it, for instance, this is a chat GPT mentioned that um, how you can persuade your manager. My manager is not here, but that, that was a joke for her. So <laughs> I wanted to ask about it and I wanted to have an answer. But apart from, from that, we can see it on the social networks. We can see with the recommendations. We can also see with our cameras. Uh, we can see that a raccoon is stealing the cat's food. So we can see it because of AI. So we, that opens our mind that, hey, we can do a lot of things with AI. We can try to do a lot of things. And the, the thing with AI is the how. We, we may think, or we can be confused, that AI is just an if-then-else if then rules, which is they can mimic the human behavior. But there is another important point, but is how you can mimic the human behavior. You can totally handcraft 
a human brain, let's, let's suppose, to try to mimic that, but that, that's not specifically AI. And that's a very interesting quote that is from 87, yes. There's a lot of things here that I have no idea, that list prologue. But basically, at the beginning, what they think is the same thing as we are thinking now. They think that they are saying that, hey, AI is not something that an, an if-then rule. Even if you use them, those programs like Lips or Prolog, which are, but I think that, I don't know if some of you are familiar with those titles, but it seems like a, a program or a rule-based system, basically. So that's not AI. So we have a lot of things that are resolved without using AI. So something really simple like, when you go to Netflix or when you go to see your movies and you get those recommendations, these recommendations that you get, they are not using AI, right? This is a rule-based system that they are very useful. I mean, they can be accurate or not, but they are not using AI. So they, they do something like artist similarity or during the time of the day, you can have a specific rule to sell, to sell you to some product or user ratings based on your history, on your ratings, on how you rate the, the movies, you can get an advice of a different movie, of a new movie. And that's a rule-based system. And you can probably say or think that this is AI, but this is not actually AI. And what is the difference between AI and non-AI is, this is a table, I mean, I will mainly highlight, but is, the main difference between AI and non-AI is how the algorithm learns. So you need to start from data. You need to use that data, the algorithms, to teach how it can learn. The other one is the, the I mean, the non-AI learning is you handcraft everything. And this is very important to think, like is when we are working on that, you can mimic that, but you can handcraft everything. And the same thing as the, adaptability, the complex, the decision making. But mainly what I want to go here in details is the examples, right? So they use neural networks, they use deep learning. This is AI, when you, have, when, you say, when you send a bunch of examples and the algorithm in a way finds a way to get a response from that input. And that's the learning process. The non-AI part is sorting algorithms, searching algorithms like I don't know if you remember all these math algorithms to find the highest, the lowest, and everything. They are very smart, of course, but that's not AI. And now we are all talking about that. It seems that AI is just LLMs. So we see, we may see AI LLMs everywhere. So we, it's, it's incredible how we like to force to use everything using just LLMs. You don't even remember, some people don't remember what is deep learning, right? So 10 years ago, or five years ago, all the talks were related to, to deep learning, like computer vision and all these topics. They, they, are, they seem to be not AI now. So when we talk about AI, we are not mentioning that. And there are a lot of things that are still solving. In AI, when we talk about that, we talk about state of the art, the soda, the SOTA, SOTA. Um, which is, for AI, is a very known term, which is when you would like to develop something, you will need to see what is the algorithm that best performs. So you need to go there. And for instance, for computer vision, we use YOLO, we use convolutional neural networks, we use for time series, which is when you would like to forecast, let's say the weather or the stocks, which is not so successful because I wouldn't be here if there is a time series algorithm to predict, but uh, that's not using LLM. So you probably can use some similar architectures, but they are state of the art and they argue, and this is something that my, my thesis, I based my study on transformers for time series, which is basically how you use the same architecture for LLMs, right, for time series. And it was good, but I had a lot of, comments about, hey, this is not the state of the art, and all the people that is using RNNs or CNNs was arguing, but because of the same thing that I'm arguing now, right? You would like to force something to use when it's not the best option. But I mean, by research, right? So research is, you try to look for new things, 
Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't, sometimes it's argued. But anyways, what I wanted to showcase here is that you have a lot of algorithms that are performing excellent. And it's the best thing that you can see today, for instance. Like to find the raccoon, the CNN are, are, are great. And there is also machine learning. Right? So we talk about machine learning, and it seems that we forgot about machine learning, about Exiboost, about if you like to use, solve a use case. And this is how it works today in a lot of industries. Like to be finance, when you need to find an algorithm to see, see if a product will be failing, will be a failure, you are using tables and you are still using algorithms that perform pretty well, like Exiboost, for instance, or decision trees, and that's also AI, and we are not mentioned. One, one important thing that I would like to mention here is also the bias. It's, we heard a lot of things about the LLMs, they are biased, that based on the data and everything. But the bias is something that as a data scientist, we, we've seen that from 10 years ago or 20 years ago, right? Because it's something that you always we have in the data because the data is biased to, some, to something. So it's a challenge that the data scientist is trying to find since 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And that is reflected on the LLMs, of course, because the LLMs is even worse because it works with data, with messages, with text, and we can face it, right? So we can, we can see something racist, even if in 10 years ago, when you have a, um, an algorithm to detect, for instance, the credit score or to detect something to loans, these models were racist and they are racist because they are based on locations and everything. Of course, you can work in the external um, alternative to try to mitigate those biases, but it's the same thing that we are doing now with LLMs. So it's, the model will be there always, but we also need to find ways to detect or to mitigate those kind of biases. That's explainable AI, that's responsible AI, there are a lot of different things that are related also with, with AI, maybe. So that's the most important part, and, and it's open source, right? So most people think, not here, but most people think that if you can download, if you can download it, you can use it, maybe. So think about it. Let's think on the AI and LLM models. So if you need to download a model, you go to a place like the GitHub, you go to Hagen Face. Any hiding phase you can find, and that's a crazy number, which I didn't know it, but we have 500,000 models there to download within not just LLMs, but could be LLMs, could be computer vision, could be NLP, could be multiple AI strategies or AI uh, topics that people train a model and they share the model there. But of course, as we all know, there are licenses in all, in all the projects. So the licenses, we can go for the most permissive, like Falcom, Strawfall LLMs, the Apaches or the M MIT licenses, which is basically you can download your model and seem as, as we hear on the keynote, that's just the model, the weights and the architecture and just the model. So you, you can have access to that, you can use it for you, you can use it whatever, so it's okay. But there is another thing that is the external API, for instance. And this is something that I realized because two months ago, I wanted to use a model using the external API. And I said, okay, what is the license when you would like to consume an API? And if you go to the site, I don't want to mention the company, but you can guess. If you go to the, to the site, there's no explicitly license as you can have here with Apache and everything. It's an API license. So basically what, what I see, and I had this conversation with a legal person from Intel also, they only say that, hey, what you are getting from your API, it's your, respons your, it's your responsibility. So we don't care about it. So it's, if, you're, if you don't know how to prompt, it, to prompt it, you can get an answer. Of course, they say that they have methods like to avoid to being racist, biases and everything. But it's basically, that's more like a, as a consumer part. So it's not for research, it's not for anything. 
And you have something really fun in the middle, which is the mix, which I used to call mix, which is Llama or Gemma from Google, which is, I don't know how, how many of you had a chance to go into the details of the license from Llama, but it's basically, we all know that, or we all think that when you are downloading Llama, Llama is open source. This is what we see, right? So Llama is open source, you can use it, you can research, you can use it for commercial, but if you go to the terms, you can see that if you have an application that it's, great, it's greater than 700 million of monthly active users, you have to talk to, to them. So we can be, we can talk about purely open source. This is not open source, right? So because you have a restriction, even if the restriction is big enough, this is not open source. I, I get we can, we can imagine why they are doing that, of course, because there is a huge competition between Google, between Meta, and between OpenAI, that is, this is mainly a restriction between their companies. Of course, we all love to have a, an application with more than 700 million of users monthly. We all love to have it, but basically this is to restrict between them to not to use, I mean, Google cannot use Llama, Meta cannot use Gem and everything. So that's, that's the main reason behind that. But in terms of open source, it means that this is not open source. And for us as um, developers, researchers, or users of those applications, we should be worried about what is the trend. Because the trend could be, and this is a good analogy when you are doing um, with, with bikes, with cycles, um, they used to, to follow the leader, right? So if the leader is trying to make it more restrictive, you will see that Meta did that, now Google did the same thing. And you will probably have in the future those big companies that they were trying to follow the same trend. And this is something that, of course, we don't want it, right? So this is, we are trying to fight. I will show you in the next slide the multiple alternatives that we are fighting, fighting for that, that is trying to make it more open, not only just to use it, but to enforce the research, which is the mainly these three or four things. One of the alternatives or one of the organizations that we are working is the AI Alliance. I mean, Intel is part of the AI Alliance and there are multiple companies, IBM, multiple companies working on that. Basically, we are trying to push the need to the openness of those models. There is an NTA uh, note, of course, and the AI Alliance created um, an answer to that NTA, which is basically to justify why AI is important, why the open, openness of those models are important. Basically, it's similar, right? So you, you need to make it available to the research. Uh, it has benefits, of course, for the security. If you find a bug in your LLMs, there is, a, there is a way that the community can fix it, as usual. Um, there is there's also a competition of choice. So once you have more models, they can, you can find or can select new models. But that's more in the openness that we all may know or we all should know about the benefits of the open source. Right? But there is another important thing for, for businesses. When, and this is... A, 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 um, a number that I didn't know it, for instance, the, since the models are not open enough, or most of the models are not open, if you try to find the top 100 most companies or universities doing research, they are not in, they are, they are not based neither in Africa or Latin America. So they are centralized in some countries. So this is when we talk about the openness of those models. So it's probably these underrepresented regions, this is how, how they say it. Uh, they cannot do some, do some research or they cannot do some contributions basically because they cannot access to those models. So that's, that's a number that I didn't know it, for instance, but it's something really, really important. The other one is the openness, right? So if you like to start a startup, if you like to have your own company, you need to find a way to use a model, to download your model, to consume it. So, of course, you need this kind of thing that you need to, to use the model. The other one is, 
and this is a, a number that from a survey that is, this is estimated that these foundation models, which is, this is another difference, right? The foundation models are the basic models, so you, when you don't do any fine tuning or everything, when you have the plain foundation model, the generic foundation model, those general models will be generated in between 2.6 trillion to 4.4 trillion in economic growth. So that's, that's something that is huge, that really, and we need to be sure that this, or we would like to help on that in the foundation model, they have to be open, they have to be more uh, openness. So that's one initiative that um, AI Alliance is working. But there is another way also that open source, what, what, what is open source with AI? This is another term that is not 100% clear yet, which is, it's the model, is the way, is the framework, is the, the data. I mean, that's not clear, to be honest. Even if we talk about that for the last two or three years, this is not clear yet. And the OSI, the, the Open Source Alliance, is also doing um, some a discussion to enable uh, what is or to, to pursue the definition of the open source in AI that anyone can join to this conversation, uh, which is mainly, let's try to define between all of us what is open source, why open source matter, and this kind of definitions. Um, I've been part from the last year-ish, and, and it's really interesting because this AI is different to any other software. So when you start to think about it, you may say, okay, yes, I mean, it's, we need to use that as an open, we need to close it, so it's, 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 it's hard to find the right way to, to mention that. And the OSI is doing that. The other one is, and now going a bit deep on the LLMs, is we think that they can reason. But let's, let's think about how we reason, how we as a humans reason. Let's suppose that we would like to do a trip. I don't know where it is, but let's suppose in the Caribbean or the beach, I don't know. What we first do is we gather all the information. So we do a Google search and we see, okay, all the model, all the models, all the cities. We base on personal experience. We talk to other people to get advices about that. We put everything together. We find the reason that we have in our minds, like, do you like, do you like the warm? Do you like outdoor? Do you like to go to the beach? Do you like the snow? I mean, whatever, all these things you have in your mind. And you take all these things and you create some hypothesis. So you say, okay, I would like to go to the beach, but I don't like the warm. I would like to go to the snow, to the mountains, but I'm scared about animals or whatever. Uh, and you have all these hypotheses in your mind. And you evaluate all of them and you make a decision. So you weigh the pros and cons, and you think what is the best option. That's mainly reasoning, right? If we think about it, and there is no test, what we think that LLM are doing is basically, we, have, we are specialists at prompting the LLM. So basically what we are doing is, we are giving that information and we are narrowing down the question and we are mainly like a forcing the model to give us that answer. It's, it's good when I would like to get convinced about something. I don't know if you probably did it. When you talk to ChatGPT or whatever and you ask about something and if they say something that you don't like it, you start arguing and they will say, oh no, you know, oh no you're what, you are right. So you were right. And that's something similar, right? So you are, how we think that the LLMs, or how the LLMs working is, we think that they have impressive reasoning abilities, but the reality is that you need to f narrow down. And there are a bunch of papers about that, that they argue on that ability of the LLMs to prompt. But that's why, basically, because they were training with a huge amount of data, of course, which is the internet, and we probably with things that we have no idea. The, the are algorithms that they generate your answer word by word. So they generate a word based on the previous word, they will give you a new word and so on and so on and so on. So they are not doing like the hypothesis, they are, they are not doing something like that. 
what they are very good, of course, is they are expert in retrieving that information. So if they have that information from their data, they, if it's trained from your weight or whatever, they are specialists on if you know how to extract it, they know how to retrieve that information, definitely. This is very good. But what I've seen in multiple papers is that there are papers that claim that they have these reasoning abilities, but when you tr start to argue that, and you start to go deep on those papers, basically, there are no proof, or they, or they, don't, they don't prove that that information that the LLMs is giving to you, you don't know if it was present on the training data, because you don't know the training data. So this is more like a question, like how we can be sure that something is truly generated if we don't know if it was present in, in the data. So that's, they can do some assumptions, they can be similar, but it's something that we don't know. And there is no test that the, the LLM gives you an answer on something that he never, it never seen that in the past. There is no test proof about it. Um, and this is something that I can say because I read a lot of papers and I couldn't find any, any justification about that. So <laughs> I would love to find something, but there is no, no proof of that. About that. So you know the generative AI, right? So with the general AI, when we talk about, we start from AI, which is the general AI, which is the next step, like is they can reason, they can take their own decisions, they can learn by themselves, and this is general AI. So we can get confused, like, hey, we are close to, gen to general AI, and the reality is that, of course, we have no idea when the, if it will come someday, we have no idea when. But this is a very interesting book that is from 20, 2014. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Nick Bolson, Bost, Bostrom, um, but their books are great. He's more like a futurist, he's a researcher. And he has a book from, which is called Super Intelligence, which mainly talks about these advancements and how far we are from general AI. And this is a quote from the book that it talks about the human level, how close we are. And he talks, it's not just his perception. He talks with a lot of AI specialists, research, academia, and people. And they all agree ish that 90% of chances that that will get in 2075. 90%. Which makes sense. I don't know if it makes sense or not, but. In 2022, which was two years ago, it was a 10% of chance, so which is true because we are a bit far away of that. But we don't know if in 40 years, which is mainly the, what they think that they will be arriving. So it's 40 years, imagine 40 years of advancements. We had ChatGPT was created two years ago. I mean, it was make it public two years ago. And the amount of things that we could do uh, because of that, because of transformers and everything, just happened in four years ish. So imagine the advances that we are away in 40 years or 60 years. So it's a lot of things of 50 years. So I don't know. I mean, it's 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 a lot of time basically. But this book talks about that. Talks about the future, the humans. I mean, it's a bit futuristic, of course, but it's very accurate in more things. So I really, I really like it. Um, all right, the last one is about the jobs. We think that the jobs will be eliminated, that we will not be working anymore. And you may think, I don't know how many of you know COBOL or program it in COBOL, which was from 1960, right? Um, and that's fun because we try to predict the future from the information that we have today, right? So if Something important from Google is if you, if you go to the Google, of course, you can fine tune the search for a particular time, a period of period. And I did a research from, 2020, from 2011 to try to find the, this, the trends, I mean, how the AI will evolve or what will be the jobs of the next generation for the 10 years, for the next 10 years. And that's really fun just to say something. And there is a quote that by 2022, robots will be physically superior to humans. And 
that was 10 years ago. Something that we saw, I mean, 10 years ago, and I mean, that was that name of, of that company. I mean, it doesn't matter, but it's something that we all think on the same thing. Like, uh, same thing for there is no cure. We say that the medical technologies will grow vastly more sophisticated as computer powers and so on and so on and so on. And this is something that didn't happen a lot. And, and the other one is about the uh, same thing, virtual humans. So we, we always have this futuristic mindset that that would save us, that would make us better and better and better. So, and that's really fun when we go to the jobs that will work same search like for 2011 when we try to see the search or the jobs that will be existing there's something really crazy like set capitalists like augmented reality architects so we we've seen something about ar but there's no architects i mean the kind of jobs that we think that it that was going to be something really really weird so the result is, as usual, uh, we, all, we all know that jobs will be migrating. So we'll be migrating to new technologies, to new roles, to something that we like, and so on. But we'll be migrating, of course. There's no fear about it. There is a, an, an important matrix and how this jobs evolution is measured, usually. This is mainly, um, yeah, it, it, it's a matrix that you put the jobs and you try to weigh the jobs based on the high exposure that the jobs has with AI and how com complementary is that job with AI. Just to mention one, I mean lawyers, for instance. Lawyers are very complementary with AI. They can very rely on AI to help them on, on paperwork, on to, I mean, they are very complementary. And they are also very exposure. So these kind of jobs are less, um, are less probable to, to be replaced by AI. Right? But if you go, for instance, with economies or other kinds that they, they have high exposure, but they are not complementary, they can easy, easily be replaced. And there's a paper that goes deep on each particular kind of job that we have now. And they say, what of them can be replaced that cannot exist in the future because of AI? And which of them are very, are not probable to be replaced. Like for instance, a dancer. A dancer, I, I, it's not attractive to see an AI robot dancing, so I prefer to see a real person. So these kind of, of jobs, they are probably, they, they won't be replaced. Right? But this is a very interesting point of view and try to think about it and to, and to see which of, which, if my role or which roles can be more replaced. I mean, not to be exaggerated. But that's a way that the academia uses to think about how it can be replaced and how it cannot be replaced. Conclusions. Uh, I think that we are on time. Oh, yeah. Um, mainly just um, a highlight about everything. Simpler is better. We can use AI. We can use very complicated things to solve what we are doing. But the reality is, of course, it's simpler. It's better, as usual. Jobs probably will be migrating to new roles. We are very far away from getting AI. General AI, and this, of course, this talk is recorded next year. We have General AI. I will be the one in that slide, like the 2011, but I can be sure that we are very far away. Open source is the key to grow. I mean, there is multiple talks in this summit that will talk about the importance of AI, how it's important and how it matters. Something that that we said that we talked about it, but it's really. The key. I mean, you know, I think that we all here we, we we share about it. The last one is be updated, of course. So keep on the trends. Try to be updated. Something really simple to follow. Not so easy to see tons of papers every day, but I mean, we should try to be updated or to know the trends then about what's going on. Some slides, uh, some Q some QR codes. Uh, we have our website, which is open at Intel, when we used to showcase everything that Intel is doing in the open source environment. OPIA as well should be here. And AI Everywhere, which is something related with AI, all the things that Intel is doing with AI, you can go there. And we have our podcast when we interview cool people from the community, from the open source uh, co uh, community. So I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for your time. Um, Thank you. Appreciate it.
Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I mean, yes. Um, I think that this this paper it's debatable, of course, uh, because it mentions one point of view, one point of view, right? So what is? I mean, I, my th my thought is um, there is one angle that you can talk about the jobs specifically, but there is another angle that you can talk about the economics of this particular country or how the developed countries uh, are more. I mean, they, they tend to be more affected by the AI, and this is something that, that, that will happen. But I like the, the question you made about the middle management. Um, I think that there is, there is no explanation, and to, to be honest, my thought is that we will be more on that side, like in the management or the, in the thinking side, uh, once we are evolving on the time. Of course, it will be a drop of work. Of it. it's, it's, it's like an evolution, right? Because if we see the jobs that we had 40 years ago, that is something that we don't even think about. It. Like, I don't think a person in the elevator pressing the buttons, right? So it's mm -hmm. not, now you have a machine or you have any, any, any other thing. So I think that the evolution, uh, and it's like talking about the future, right? Will be more on the thinking side of things instead of the automation part of things. I think that we always be needed, of course, uh, but I think that there's a trend that is going there. And will be a different stage. This paper talks about the different stages. Like, if the country is most economically developed, is more sustainable to be affected. Right. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think that there's a lot of marketing behind that. Same for the reasoning uh, for LLMs, of course. Uh, what I think is that um, we'll still, I mean, we'll be growing a lot on ways to provide context to the models, to to whatever, right? It could be LLMs, could be computer vision, whatever. Um, I think that the models will be getting better and better and better until one moment that they will be able to perform a task or, or, or whatever, but you still need to find to mix that with a technique that can make you that can provide you the context. That today is RAG, for instance, for LM, but in the future it will be definitely something different. But I think that there is a huge trend on that, like trying to provide that context in a different way, which is RAG, right? Um, and I think that most companies are trying to see that because now there's no the focus to have something. Like, the foundation model, great and awesome, because we are all realizing that the foundation model is not the best answer to everything. You cannot pr 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 provide all the context, so you need to find a way to provide multiple contexts. So I think that that, that thing is to say, okay, we have a model with all the context available, it's 
more about having a huge model with a huge amount of information, which is probably the same foundation model, but bigger, right? But when you are, if you ground down that, and if you are to, to, to use the Fourier application, you use a new technique to provide the context. So today is RAC, and in four months or three months, what's great, but I think that that, that will be cost evolving uh, because the main problem is the context all the time. And we cannot give all the information to a model to memorize it, basically. So we, I think that they, 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 could, they could be for different tasks. Foundation model are good for writing, good for creating, and so on, which is great. Uh, but when you, you need to mix that with your context to have something meaningful, basically. Thank you. Yes, I think that one, one, one thing that I can comment on that is that I agree with the part, you have a model, right? So, but you would like to use it for something. So these models are huge. They need a lot of compute, they need a lot of things. So if you're a researcher, if you don't have a huge machine, so you cannot use it, basically because you don't have the hardware. So what I see like a, a trend is like, when we start developing that, we are talking about the data scientists, what they just care about having a model that performs, right? So they, they, they don't care if it's huge, if it's giant or whatever, they just want a model that performs well on something. But when you go to the implementation, you need to make it work. You need to use a tiny CPU or not 100% of GPU, not 100 GPUs. So there's a trend that is in, in terms of optimizations for that models to make it fit. For instance, with the models, in the last year, you will see probably Olama. Right, so that you can run your model in your CPU. And this is something that two years ago, a year ago, six months ago, it didn't exist. So what, what I see that now we are in the, in, in the part of, we have the models, but we like to use it. And in order to use it, we need to find optimization ways to make it use on the, on, on the hardware. Of course, you will need a hardware, right? But try to avoid to make these huge hardwares because there are a lot of engineering and optimizing the algorithms. To do the prior analysis. Yeah, I mean, there's But it's the same challenge as we have for when, when, when we were using machine learning in the past, for instance. We had some models, and the model it's if I have a model for my data, it, doesn't, it just worked for me. So how can I make it grow with the other? And we are facing the same problem here. It's, it's mainly, but I think that there are a lot of interests on AI and LM, so most, there are new communities. There are a lot of people working on that. There are healthcare specific people working on that. Finance people, they are trying to find those generic or less generic models to work specifically on that particular vertical. 
Um, but I see that it's the same similar challenge as we have in the past with machine learning. So it's. I mean, from scratch, there are some research that is, they, they are doing this few shot training or something like that. But to be honest, they all start from a big model. Uh, yes, I mean, we start with a big model and start to find out. But, but you cannot start from a tiny model with a tiny data because it, it, this is how the architecture works. You need tons of data to make it work. Uh, so that would be... I don't know if it's possible to be honest, but that would be great to have just a training model with a tiny data set and they can be they can behave as a GPT. I'm not sure. What they are trying to do is trying to do, starting from that big model, trying to make it tiny, 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 tiny. In the knowledge, right? So more than the process. But yeah. We are all fine, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. <laughs>